speak. First of all, can I ask, can you hear me? Okay, that's, that's fantastic. So it's a great pleasure and a great honor for me to be here in this historic lecture theater on the 240th anniversary of the death of the founder, Carl Linnaeus himself. So um, this year has been designated the International Year of the Reef. In fact, it's the third International Year of the Reef. And I'm going to look uh, at the question, what hope is there for corals in this International Year of the Reef, balancing uh, a whole series of uh, different uh, problems and uh, different strengths. So um, here we have one of the problems. It's a hurricane. This is uh, a photograph I took when I was working with colleagues on the reef, uh, the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef in Belize, just off the, the, uh, the, the coast of Belize. And there I am diving uh, on quite a rare, uh, not many people have been there, which is the corals uh, off Hainan Island in China. Anybody been to Hainan? No, it's, it's quite challenging, but uh, great fun, uh, I can assure you. So uh, I'm going to look at, very briefly, because this is only a short lecture, uh, reef values and threats, climate change. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on reefs in the Caribbean, uh, talk a little about geoengineering, and then how we can all engage in the International Year of the Reef. I suppose if there was one message I'd like you to take away from this lecture, uh, as well as the fact that it's the International Year of the Reef, is the connectivity of the ecosystems that relate to coral reefs. Here uh, we have uh, the bottom left, there's our lovely coral reef, but that is interconnected with seagrass beds and mangrove forests that ultimately lead on to coastal forests. So for example, uh, the uh, small fish and invertebrates that are spawned on the coral reef uh, go through seagrass beds to uh, develop in mangrove forests which protect them against predators. And then when they're grown sufficiently, they go back through the seagrass beds uh, to the coral reefs uh, where they themselves spawn. And it's the connectivity that's important. We can't think of preserving coral reefs without also thinking of preserving seagrass beds uh, and mangrove forests. I've worked quite a bit in uh, policy development in various parts of the world, and to do that, you have, of course, to uh, talk in ways uh, that uh, quantify economic benefits from ecosystem uh, services for, for coral reefs. And here is a, a, a diagram I developed from uh, data on T from TEEB uh, a few years ago. As you might expect, the largest uh, one is on uh, uh, ecotourism, um, but also you have some very other, very important uh, uh, financial uh, benefits, moderation of extreme events, for example, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, recreation, uh, maintenance of genetic diversity, as I'm sure many of you know, Coral reefs are the equivalent of rainforests in terms of their genetic diversity, uh, obviously aesthetics, amenity, and a whole host of, of different ecosystem benefits that are important. So what are the threats? Basically, I can say they come from four broad categories, uh, coastal development, um, pollution, uh, over-exploitation of resources, particularly overfishing, uh, and inland pollution and sediments. And I've put up there some of the issues. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned that I was diving in Hainan, just off the south coast. Uh, the Chinese have made Hainan part of their internal resort structure and have destroyed almost all the coral reefs just by Sanya and are building mega resorts uh, for uh, the very large number of uh, internal holidaymakers there um, without any feeling uh, for how coral reefs. It's a bit like what's happened in Dubai. So there are lots of big problems uh, there. Um, 
I thought this would be interesting to show, particularly in the Linnaean Society. This is a publication that came out a few months ago uh, on uh, relating maps to uh, coral reefs uh, currently. This is a 1770s map of the Florida Keys. What's interesting is that many of the reefs are still there offshore. Most of the inshore reefs have been demolished by coastal development and dredging. And these were the days before what we now think of as climate change, uh, which are decimating uh, so many of our reefs. I've just put up there some of the uh, graphs that I'm sure many of you will know, the rise in uh, global temperatures, rises in sea level, uh, and of course ocean acidification, uh, which is so harmful, uh, particularly to calcifying organisms like corals. The main problem that we have uh, are rises in sea surface temperatures. Warm water temperatures can result in coral bleaching. And what I've brought with me are a number of corals that I will be very happy to hand out. And basically, there are two, two types of corals. They're the brain-type corals, which are those. And they're these, which are the branching corals, which are, as you can see, very delicate, uh, which uh, break up very easily. So uh, I will need them back. But if you'd just like to look at them, um, these are some of the corals. Obviously, they're, they're bleached. Uh, they don't have any uh, coral polyps in them. But uh, just to give you a feeling for uh, corals, for those of you who aren't uh, diving. Corals uh, exist in uh, symbiotic relationships with little algal cells, little uh, algal cells, uh, we call them zooxanthellae, that contain all the photosynthetic machinery to take sunlight, use sunlight as an energy source, uh, and use that energy uh, to enable the corals to take carbon dioxide from the seawater and produce the calcifying uh, structures that, uh, you can, uh, that you can see when I'm handing them around. When corals bleach, the temperature rises. It's the same if it falls, actually, but particularly when it rises in terms of global warming. Uh, that the coral then goes white, and that's why we call it bleaching. Corals can survive a bleaching event. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. But they're under more stress, and if the temperatures go too high or last too long, then they can die. This is the International Year of the Reef. There's been a fantastic film uh, made. It's uh, owned by Netflix. And it's called Chasing Coral. And I'm going to show you a very small um, excerpt from it. The idea is to get as many shots as we can in as many positions of as many pieces of coral as we can. And to repeat that every single day. Imagine your body temperature rises one degree centigrade or two degrees centigrade. Over a period of time, that would be fatal. And that's the seriousness of the issue when you look at it in terms of the ocean. You forget what it looked like at the beginning. And some days when you go back, it's dead as far as you can see. I thought we would find bleaching. I thought we would capture it. But I don't think I ever prepared myself or thought we were going to see this.
the warming trends on the planet are so rapid. Okay, I'll just cut off Ruth Gates there. She's wonderful, but um, if you get a chance to see the film, then uh, I would recommend it strongly. And as you can see from this, um, this map, coral bleaching is absolutely global. Serious coral bleaching happens worldwide in all the reefs that we know. And I think what you could also see, perhaps from that film, you know, in two months, wow, not only is it bleached, it's dead. What you also might have noticed from the film, when the coral was, was very much alive, there were lots of fish around the coral. When it was dead, almost no fish. No corals, no life. There was a, a report uh, just a couple of months ago from, uh, the, uh, from the United Nations uh, saying that the world coral reefs are in great danger. Uh, and by the mid-century, i.e. the century we're now in, Unless carbon emissions are reduced enough to slow ocean warming, the consequences could be severe for millions of people. So it's not just what's happening to the marine life, it's a people issue. You saw in the film the, uh, the problem with the Great Barrier Reef, and what I've put down here is the severe bleaching that happened one year and then the next year for the most severe bleaching on the reefs. And one of the interesting things is that not all that bleaching is due to an El Nino event. Other things uh, are happening. Certainly global warming is happening. Certainly the sea surface temperatures are rising. But you can get uh, coral bleaching outside an El Nino because of temperature rise. There was a paper uh, in Science uh, just over a week ago uh, from the Australian group um, showing that this is happening globally. So it's a very serious uh, event. You can see uh, at least 50% of the Great Barrier Reef has been bleached uh, in those two years. Very, 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 very bad. I'm going to share with you um, what I've been doing uh, on the Jamaican reefs in the Caribbean. Uh, anybody been to Jamaica? Okay, anybody been to Discovery Bay? Okay, this, great, somebody there. Uh, Discovery Bay is a very famous marine laboratory uh, started by Tom Goro uh, way back in the 1950s. Um, and uh, is one of the most data-rich places for not only current corals, but also uh, very early coral reefs and coral reef development uh, globally. So those are the sites that I've been working on. Um, this is a picture of the, uh, the area. Uh, here's the bay, Discovery Bay. The reefs uh, are just out, fringing reef, just out beyond the bay uh, there. You might think that uh, tourism was the biggest uh, money spinner for Jamaica. In fact, it's bauxite export. And uh, for those of you who might have seen the film Cool Runnings. Anybody seen the film Cool Runnings? Okay, this is where they practiced on that slide. Okay, so here's a picture of the reef crest in 1973. And as you can see, it's dominated by a coral, a branching coral, a copra palmata, uh, very kindly uh, photograph from Phil Dustin. And people who dived then say they almost had to break through this weed uh, in order to get down to the deeper reefs. Here's a picture I took in 2005. Almost all the coral has vanished. All the branching coral has vanished. Uh, you've just got some uh, Montastria orbicella there, almost entirely dominated by macroalgae. The other reason I'm showing this picture is these fish, these blue wrasse, are about that size. There are no large fish around the coast. They've all been overfished. You have to go a long way away to the Pedro Banks to actually find uh, proper fishing. So this is a graph showing the percentage coral cover from the 70s until the 90s. Uh, and it used to be, you know, 70%, uh, 10 meters depth. Uh, and as you can see, there's been this fall, a big fall in 1980. Anybody hazard a guess? what caused such a dramatic fall? 
uh, could have been that it wasn't a change in sea level. It relates to my very first slide, something I showed on the very first slide. It's a hurricane, absolutely. It's Hurricane Allen, uh, and you can see the path in the dotted line in the bottom uh, left-hand slide there, uh, where Hurricane Allen passed very close to Discovery Bay, just along that north coast of Jamaica. There's a satellite view of the uh, hurricane, and the picture on the bottom right, almost identical to where I took the picture of Discovery Bay, shows the waves um, which were calculated to be 12 meters. The wave height was 12 meters high. So if you can imagine what the underwater energy would be for those waves just smashing on the reefs. And that's the reason that uh, it caused such uh, a tremendous uh, downturn in the coral reefs. So I've been applying computational modeling to coral growth data. Uh, this is uh, an example. You get uh, growth rings in some corals, uh, just like you get um, uh, tree rings. Uh, this is from X-ray photographs. Uh, and to cut a, a story short, uh, we found that severe storms not only destroy branching corals, like the Acropora palmata and the Cervicornis that I've passed around, uh, but also severely limit non-branching coral recruitment. That is the reproduction and settlement of small coral planulae onto the substrate, probably owing to stresses on reproduction. After all, corals are animals, just like us, uh, and changes in topography. That's the three-dimensionality of the reefs. In 2005, there was the highest uh, temperature uh, recorded in the Caribbean since records had begun in the 19th century. And I and uh, many others uh, came together to uh, model this and follow this throughout the Caribbean. Here's a graph uh, on the left-hand side showing what we call degree heating weeks. So degree heating weeks means the number of degrees for one week. So one degree heating week means one degree centigrade for one week. 16 degree heating weeks means 16 degrees for one week or one degree for 16 weeks or something in between. So it's a, it's a rough measure uh, to give you an idea of rising sea surface temperatures and the rises there. And you can see uh, that uh, there were significant, you know, 15, 16 uh, degree heating week uh, in particularly in the uh, Lesser Antilles, uh, to the east of the Caribbean. And over there, you can see that correlated very well with coral bleaching. So that's a complete loss of the zooxanthellae, a complete loss of those colored algal cells uh, in, the, in the corals. Interestingly, um, we looked at the hurricanes that year, and some of you may remember that 2005 was the year of Hurricane Katrina. It was a very severe hurricane year uh, because the sea surface temperatures were so high. And because hurricanes get their energy from high temperatures, high sea surface temperatures, that cools the water. And so what we found was that where the hurricanes had passed over, uh, in fact, you didn't get the bleaching. So it's sort of a yin-yang type of effect. A key question is how much temperature rise do you need, not just for bleaching, but for death? And so we uh, put this uh, figure together that you can see uh, mean coral bleach uh, very much uh, there on the top one. But on the second one, we can see uh, the mortality related to the maximum degree heating weeks. And basically, if you have more than eight degree heating weeks in your coral uh, situation, uh, you're much more likely uh, to get coral mortality after coral bleaching. I was looking at the time on my reefs in Dairy Bull, one of the reefs of just off Discovery Bay. Uh, here's a picture I took uh, in April 2006 at the top. Uh, almost all the Acropora cervicornis, that's the branching coral here that I've been passing around, 
uh, had gone. It had died. You can see it's overgrown there with macroalgae. Uh, it was a tragedy. One of my big Acropora palmata colonies had, had died too that I'd been following for years. You know, you feel very personally involved with these things. Uh, but the good news is that um, on this particular reef, when I went back in 2008, the Acropora cervicornis was really recovered uh, from almost 100% uh, uh, mortality. It had really recovered. You can see the coral vibrant there, lots of color, lots of zooxanthellae, lots of growth. Really exciting. And of course, one of the key questions uh, is, why should some reefs recover and others don't? So here's a graph uh, that I've plotted of this particular reef. Uh, you can see the great fall uh, of not just of cervicornis, but of a number of corals. Uh, and uh, they recovered uh, right up and have maintained largely their recovery uh, since that time because there have been no major environmental issues uh, on, on the Jamaican reef since then. Why do some coral reefs recover and others don't? Well, we don't have time to go into it. Basically, it's a complex uh, story that has to do with topography, that's the three-dimensionality of the reef, and also the sequestering of genetic material uh, that allow reefs to develop when the extreme conditions recover. Here's a, a very interesting study uh, that was published a couple of months ago from Australia. There's the Great Barrier Reef. And what this study showed very briefly is that there are some robust reefs, particularly towards the middle and south of the Great Barrier Reef, that um, have high replenishment potential uh, while they also have a low risk of ble bleaching and crown of thorns starfish, that's cots, crown of thorn starfish, outbreaks. Crown of thorn starfish uh, is one of the big problems. There have been millions of dollars spent on crowns of thorn starfish research. We still don't know why there are these great outbreaks, uh, but there are. Uh, but some reefs are more susceptible than others to them. And what this particular study showed, very much hot off the press, uh, is that some reefs uh, are more robust, and also uh, they can act as uh, replenishers uh, for the genetic material to restore other reefs. Well, that's, uh, you know, it's a big topic, and uh, there are lots of questions still in that. But at least that's one of the encouraging signs uh, as we move forward in this international year of the reef. Way back in 2009, I was one of 21 scientists at the Royal Society who uh, agreed, and to get 21 international scientists to agree is difficult. Anyway, we did it. Agree a document that went to the Conference of the Parties, you may remember, in Copenhagen that, that year. Uh, we might have torn it all up for all the good it did, but we did it. And uh, it's still there, and somebody at a, uh, a meeting just before Christmas, big meeting uh, in Oxford, actually referred to it. But if we don't adhere to all the carbon emission uh, decreases that have been agreed in more recent meetings, then I think we have to look at other ways. And I've been involved in looking at what we call geoengineering, which is the deliberate large-scale intervention in the Earth's natural systems to counteract climate change. Highly controversial. You wouldn't do it if other things were working, but we need to research it. There are two sorts. There's carbon dioxide removal. Uh, for example, uh, you could argue that more uh, forests were, were good because they take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That's a very simple way of uh, lowering the carbon dioxide. Uh, and I've worked with uh, some Chinese um, colleagues in the Chinling Mountains about that. What I want to talk about is solar radiation management, uh, which uh, is where you actually stop sunlight uh, coming in to warm the earth up. And uh, we published this paper. Uh, it pub was published online about a couple of months ago with my colleagues uh, at the Hadley Center in Exeter and also in Beijing on uh, how if you inject 
sulfur dioxide particles into the atmosphere, uh, you would uh, decrease the sea surface temperatures. And you can see here, uh, we've looked at a particular, what's called uh, um, radiative uh, forcing uh, methodology. It's modeling. We could talk about that if you want. Uh, 4.5. It's not quite business as usual, but it's where you stabilize radiative forcing due to greenhouse gases shortly after uh, 2100. Uh, and that's showing the red is the rising sea surface temperatures on the right. To if you inject particles, you can see that you do lower sea surface temperatures uh, significantly throughout the Caribbean and indeed in also in the in the Indo-Pacific too. So you know, in terms of the modeling studies, that looks very promising. Furthermore, the modeling shows that you don't alter coral growth. And also, and this is very important, uh, that you increase the return period of very severe Category 5 hurricanes. So you can see here on the graph, uh, if the red line is if you don't do anything, uh, it looks like uh, the return period is going to uh, get almost to every year. And this is exactly what this paper in Publishing Science uh, just over a week ago was saying. But if you do geoengineering, then you increase the return time. You make it longer for ca Category 5 hurricanes to come back. The question is then, do you make it long enough to come back in order for the reefs to recover? Uh, and, uh, that's an issue. But I think it's important that research in geoengineering uh, continues. Certainly part of the future is community involvement. That's one of the things that International uh, Year of the Reef is trying to do. Here's some work that I and my colleagues, when we went to Jamaica, were doing. We used to talk in schools. Uh, this is one school uh, that we went to. As you know, Jamaicans are wonderful people, but they're not exactly quiet. Um, and uh, when we were in this school, uh, they actually had to give me a megaphone. I don't know if you can see it on the slide to make myself heard to the audience. Uh, that wasn't sufficient. And you can see one of the teachers actually wheeling something on. That's a karaoke machine. Very exciting. OK, so uh, community involvement, extremely important. So we need to engage with people to support reef awareness. Um, I'm chair of the ICRS Education Committee, and we have material. I see Dan here, uh, who's done some wonderful work uh, for us, uh, material for educating uh, people, not only who are coral reef scientists, but also uh, the, the members of the public. Uh, we have our own, uh, I have my own Twitter account, and you might like to follow that uh, when I talk about uh, coral reefs. Uh, International Year of the Reef, IOR 2018, uh, that's uh, something about it. Uh, it now has its own website and its own Twitter uh, account, too. So it's important that we engage to support reef awareness uh, for uh, all members of the public. Uh, as T.S. Eliot said in one of his poems, time past and time future allow but a little consciousness. And uh, now is the time uh, that we need to help coral reefs. That's me diving uh, on Jamaica, just to show you that I do dive. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>